All right, so in this video, we're going to look at another um, t test, another two sample t test, uh, an independent t test. Um, we, we can actually tell it's independent uh, for, for, it must be independent because the group sizes are not the same. And that's one sure giveaway. Uh, when they're the same, it's not necessarily independent or paired, but when they're different, they can't be paired. So what we're gonna look at in this, in this example is we're going to look at another two sample t-test, but in a previous video, I did it as a unpooled test uh, where we did not assume that the variances were equal. And so we, we went through this very complicated formula to calculate that in the, um, in the pooled case, uh, we're going to assume that they're equal. Uh, whether or not that's true or not, um, you know, is going to depend on how you know rigorous the assumptions are. Um, again, in a more advanced statistics class, you could actually conduct a test to see if they're uh, you know essentially equivalent. Um, and you in in a in a rigorous analysis, you would want to do that. But in this particular video, the thing that I'm concerned about is just being able to calculate the test statistic and get the p-value if you make those assumptions. It used to be very much more common to make this assumption that the, the, the standard deviations were equal and to use the pooled test because it is a little less complicated to calculate uh, if you make that assumption. Uh, but particularly with the advent of technology and things like that, we we uh, statisticians often prefer the unpooled case specifically because it doesn't make this strong assumption that the mean the the standard deviations are equal. All right, so let's uh, look at our problem and set up our hypothesis tests. Um, that doesn't depend. That part doesn't depend on um, whether we're doing it pooled or unpooled. Uh, do employees perform better at work with music playing? Music was turned on during the working hours, uh, working hours of a business with 55 employees. Their productivity leveled five, uh, averaged 5.2 um, with a standard deviation of 2.4. On another day, the music was turned off when there were only 50 workers on site. Uh, the worker's productivity level averaged 4.8 with a standard deviation of 1.2. And we want to test the hypothesis. Um, now, we want to know if they perform better at work. So this is going to be a one-tailed test. So let's write out our null hypothesis. Null hypothesis is that um, mean one equals mean two. And again, the equality always goes in the null. And then what we want to test, mean one is when the music was playing. And we want to know if that is better than when the music was not playing. So that's our greater than inequality in this direction. Um, now, another way to express this is that mean one minus mean two is greater than zero. That is an equivalent expression for this. Um, so that, that's another way to think about it as we do our, our calculations. Now, let's look briefly at the formulas before we go over to Excel. The uh, formulas here are going to be about pooling our standard deviations. So to get this pooled, sometimes you'll see it actually written as SP, our pooled standard deviations. Um, if in fact you are, if you have the data for the pool uh, instead of just the sample statistics, the simplest way to calculate this pooled standard deviation is just simply to dump all of your values into a single uh, data set basically and calculate the standard deviation on them. I mean, that's almost equivalent. Um, now, the only, the only difference with that is that you would be dividing by n1 plus n2 minus 2 because it's n1 n1 n sub 1 minus 1 and n sub 2 minus 1. Um, but we're we don't have the raw data so we don't have to worry about that minor distinction. Uh, we're going to have to actually calculate it from the standard deviations that we have. 
Uh, and so, and then once we get that pooled test statistic, then we can calculate our standard error. And from that, we can calculate our t-test. Now, again, keep in mind that uh, if we were hypothesizing a particular difference, this numerator would be a little bit larger, a little bit different. It would have an extra uh, set of differences that would represent the difference that we were hypothesizing between the two groups. But since our initial hypothesis is that they're equal, those that difference is zero. So it drops out of the equation. All right, let's go over to Excel. All right. Now again, first things first is we're gonna pull our, our statistics out of the problem and then start beginning to calculate our values. So let's start with mean one. Uh, mean one was 5.2 and S1. Um, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna need to, to do some math on these. So I'm just gonna pull out S1 rather than the variance. Um, because I want to explain what I what we have to do in order to to get this formula. Um, and then we want n one is fifty five, and then mean two. Oops, mean two uh, was four point eight, and S two was. Um, S2 was 1.2, and then N2 was 50. Okay, so uh, now we're, we're gonna start calculating these things. Now, what we want to do uh, first is we wanna get to the variances. Um, now to get, uh, actually to get to this, we wanna get to this sum ultimately, but the variance itself is this sum divided by uh, the, the count minus one. So if we get to the variance first, S1 squared, that's going to be S1 squared. And then the sum um, of the square differences for group one, Again, that's just this portion of this formula is going to be the variance times the count minus one for that group. Because remember, we calculate the variance for each group. We calculate each observation minus the mean, we square them, we add them all up. And then we divide by n minus one because it's a sample. So if I multiply the variance by n minus one, then I will get just this summation. And so now I'm gonna do some square differences for the second case, which is going to be, um, actually I need to do my S2 squared, which is going to be S2 squared and then some square differences. Part two is going to be, again, this number times the denominator minus one. So essentially I'm just using the variance formula to do a little bit of algebra in order to get these components because I don't have the raw data. Now, once I have these, these sum of squares differences, then I can add those together. We'll call that pooled numerator. And that's going to be this plus this. And then the um, denominator, pooled denominator is going to be N1 plus N2 minus two. And then finally, pooled S, well, let's actually just call it SP since that's common in formulas, 
um, that is going to be the pooled numerator that we calculated divided by the pooled denominator. And uh, that's the um, S pooled squared. Now, again, keep in mind, um, that's the variance. That's gonna go in our formula underneath the square root. If we wanted to do a double check to make sure that this, the, what we would expect is the standard deviation is going to be somewhere in between the uh, standard deviation for one group and the standard deviation for the other group. So if we took the square root of this, uh, it's not gonna be like the average or anything uh, because the two groups are not the same size, but it should be sort of in that, that ballpark. Uh, but what we're going to do is uh, we can still compare it to S1 squared and S2 squared. And our pooled variance is in between the previous two variances. So um, that is that is in a reasonable number to expect. Um, sometimes these logic checks can help you catch um, if you're missing a parentheses or if you did some calculation incorrectly. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the standard error for our test statistic. That's this denominator. And so that's going to be the square root of the pooled variance times 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. And then close the square root. Again, this is just that denominator in the test statistic. And then our test statistic is going to be the difference in our means divided by our standard error. Okay, so now that we have the test statistic, then we can go ahead and calculate our degrees of freedom. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is that the degrees of freedom is going to be n1 plus n2 minus 2. All right, so p value, t dot dis dot 2t, our x value, oh, actually, we're not doing a 2t1. We're doing a, this was, we were assessing whether mu one was greater than mu two. So mu one minus mu two is positive. So this is a right tail test. You have to keep the, the, what we're actually testing in mind. All right, so then our test statistic is this. This looks very small, doesn't seem very promising to me. And then the denominator again, that was the degrees of freedom. And so we get a, a p-value of 0.145. And so this is greater than our typical significance level of 0.05. So we fail to reject the null. And so we conclude that it does not appear to make any difference. Um, playing music does not appear to significantly impact, um, statistically significantly impact um, productivity. Okay.